These last two weeks, we've talked about the purpose of our call and staying true to our call and all of the things that tear us away from keeping our focus on following Christ. It's a problem humanity deals with time and time again um, as, we, as we go through all of the different temptations of life. And so we come to the scripture passages this time, where in two very different time periods, we have the words of Isaiah and the words of Christ, calling the people back to covenant, back to discipleship living, and asking them to root themselves and anchor themselves in it. Um, for Micah, um, there was trouble last week and thinking that God needed sacrifices and more sacrifices. And the reason God was mad was because he wasn't getting his 10,000s of rivers of oil. And Micah was like, y'all, it's do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. And today... Isaiah is calling the people against their fasting. It's, we have to put on our sackcloth and ashes. We have to fast. And that is what God wants. And Isaiah is, no, this is the fast that I choose. To break the bonds of injustice and to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. Because it's not the ritual that God is most interested in. It's how we live our lives and share that blessing of God that we have been given all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant of God choosing Abraham and blessing him and all the people so that God can bless all the families of the earth. And so how do we be a channel for that blessing and not a stop for it? And so the problem with the fasting this week is that it was empty ritual, that people would be coming together and fasting and then just turning around and oppressing their workers and striking with wicked fists and doing all kinds of things that didn't carry out the fasting. So this Sunday sermon is based on a talk that I had with Toby last Sunday um, and how our call is um, to make space for the miracle to happen. Um, so how do we live in such a way that miracles are possible? How do we live in such a way that we put the ingredients into life that miracles are made of? She talked about this in terms of her landscaping and the designing and the work that she does in setting up so that everything has the nutrients and, and the light and everything else, the water and such that they need to then for the miracle, the magic of growth to happen. It's not that we cause that miracle, bring it about, but what we do and how we prepare for it does matter in terms of whether things grow well or are up against a very steep hill or lots of erosion um, in terms of how well they can grow. So um, just a funny example, I had a colleague of mine um, in relating to fasting when um, I was still unwed and not dating anyone, and he would come up to me and be like, Chamaca, hay que ayunar, es hora de ayuno. Okay, you got to start fasting because this prayer thing just isn't working fast enough, and so it's time to focus. <laughs> And as much as I love Miguel de Pieces, um, and we have a great relationship, um, the reason I got married is because I continually went out and put myself in positions and in places where I could meet someone new. It'd be kind of hard for God to make the miracle of me finding my soulmate by delivering him to my apartment door where I'm praying and fasting through a secured building. <laughs> And it meant that I had to spend my only nights free going on dates that were terrible, at which point even having a good story from the bad experience just didn't seem like it was worth it either. But it's what we put into life, what we give to make it possible. In another very um, un-Methodist related example, um, my grandfather always complained that um, he and grandma always had to host their bridge parties um, because the group was always like, he makes the best cocktails. He's the one that has the best, and so we can't go anywhere else. We have to go um, to the loonies. I kid you not, that's my mom's maiden name. It explains a lot, right? <laughs> um, so we got to go to the loonies. And my grandpa would just complain and be like, the reason they taste so good is because I buy the good 
stuff. Like anyone can do this. You got to just make sure you have the good stuff on hand um, and didn't exactly want to be always spending the money for that good stuff um, and having the parties over. So the question that Isaiah is putting before us, is putting before Israel, is what are we willing to give and to sacrifice in order to put the right ingredients into life for the good stuff to be made? And I want to share a story with you about my last appointment um, because I got to watch this very thing happen. And it was an incredible journey and an incredible witness. Um, I got there, and Wesley was really struggling. It was down to 40, 45 people a Sunday. Um, the only reason that they were um, there is because the district superintendent was able to do something um, creative um, because they were hemorrhaging about $10,000 a month. Um, and so they went from, yeah, exactly, Tim, <laughs> it was painful. They went from a full-time pastor to a part-time pastor. Um, and typically that means a retired pastor, a student pastor is brought in. And this is nothing against those people, but it's hard to give the kind of work on a part-time um, basis that's needed. And so instead of doing that, they paired it with another church um, in the area that was stronger and more vibrant to help with the mentoring situation and then made a full-time appointment, so it's half-time at this church church in half time um, at the other. And so we came in to do this work, um, and I love the people to pieces, um, but the ingredients were there, but they weren't on the shelves. They weren't out um, because fear had taken over. And I called it um, the drowning, um, active drowning victim status, right? Because um, visitors would come in, and that'd be the lifeboat. And those poor visitors would be jumped on. Um, and like, oh my gosh, it's going to be okay. You're here. You're going to save us. Um, and if you were a visitor that happened to, yeah, not so much, right? Like, I'd be heading out. And, you know, as lifeguards, we're taught when we encounter an active drowning victim, right, you don't come near them because they'll just take you under because they're so afraid that they'll use anything they can get to climb out on top. So you're supposed to just circle around them waiting for themselves to tire them out until you can finally come and help them. And it gets even better. Like if you're in a dangerous situation and neither of you are safe, you're allowed to punch them and knock them out so that then you can take them to safety. Right? So there's some kind of dramatic measures um, to get people the help and the work um, that is needed in the time. Um, and we went through meeting after meeting, and my seventh month in, it just wasn't working. Um, it wasn't working relationally with the fear. It wasn't working logistically with the finances. We were still 40000 in the red and on a budget that just was bare bones. Nothing else could be cut. And so the district superintendent um, activated our paragraph 213 of our book of discipline, which meant he called in a team of lay people and clergy from all over the conference to come and do interviews and a review of Wesley to make a recommendation of whether Wesley would stay open or would close. This was one of the hardest processes that I've ever been through with a community. And let me tell you, the fear was real. And let me also say the pointing of finger was very real as well. Until one meeting and the one night, um, and we had been working through this and spinning those hamster wheels. And finally, the question was posed in this way. Look, if you were to close tomorrow, who in the community would notice? And there was silence. And Wesley did the brave thing, and they were honest, and they said no one. No one would notice. It wouldn't affect anyone besides us. And then Ola Kolarye stood up and said no and started organizing, and that was the time when everything changed. Because that was the first moment we took an honest look and were willing to own where things were, and then invite God in to build something new. And we started, we started feeding the hungry. We had a city-run housing apartment building across the street, and we started showing up and visiting and caring and bringing communion and meals. And we started 
bringing the homeless poor into, how, into um, our, not our particular house, but in the other two sites, we had three shelters between the two, and we started volunteering, and we started working. And then we started a jazz program because there should be some fun in this, right, too? And build a bridge with the community that wasn't just church-based and was a way for people to come and check things out um, at a lower barrier. And I will tell you, the leadership team I left was about a third of people who came from that jazz at Wesley program and started coming to Wesley from there. All of a sudden, the light started breaking forth. The healing started happening, and the visitors who came stayed. And the best part of it all, Wesley found their call and who they were. Because all of this work was amazing and what was happening, but what we really found that Wesley was really good at was being a sending church, was taking all the students in who were here in their master's programs at the various universities and the fellows who are part of the National Institute of Health, who are a part of a diverse community that they had not ever been a part of before, and a part of studies and reading and studying the Bible and then applying it to their work. And all of a sudden, we have a Wesley diaspora all around the world. We have Wesley people who are now serving in Liberia and in Nigeria and in Cameroon and in India, not to mention the United States as well, because Wesley found their light, because they were able to hear a very, very hard word and take it in and do something about it. So when I stand before you all and talk about call and talk about finding what it is that only God can accomplish through Epworth, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I want us to find. This is what I want us to seek after with absolutely all of who we are. It's going to look different than it looked at Wesley because we're not Wesley. But I want us to know what it is here. And that's what John and I will be doing when we gather our geographic meeting groups so that we can listen to your story and your faith experiences and how you have seen and felt and understood and experienced God at work in your life. Of how God has changed your truth or reinforced your understanding and your call so that we can start listening to each other and finding those moments and piecing them together to find what our next faithful step is. And I've seen it. I've seen the way healing springs up, and I've seen the way light breaks forth in you all. It is one of the most amazing, beautiful, empowering experiences I can ever share or speak to. And I want us to know that here at Etworth. I want us here at Etworth to be so vital to our community that if something shuts down or closes, all our community will be in an uproar because they won't have the salt that they need that preserves their life and makes it worthwhile. That they won't have the light that they need to bring hope and to find the resiliency and the renewal to keep going when things like what we shared today in joys and concerns happen and life shuts down. We have already done some discernment here in shining our light for Jesus Christ and finding that call. I want to find out specifically how we do that in the words of Micah and Isaiah so that we don't just talk about it and we don't just do the rituals here on Sunday, but that we live it every single day and that Cockeysville knows it and like my grandpa, we have a bridge party here that everybody wants to come to because they know the good stuff is here. Amen.